morning. Well, what sense are you making of the current market activity we're seeing on the NSC, where there just seems to be too many unresolved issues deterring any sustainable upward momentum on the local bourse? Yes, that's right. Um, mm -hmm. We're, of course, in the sort of quiet summer months uh, when a lot of market participants are, of course, on holiday. Uh, but um, some key things, I mean, we've gone through most of the second quarter earnings, for instance. Um, so really, investors are just looking at economic data, you know, looking for a significant catalyst, you know, to spur uh, buying activity. Um, they haven't had that. And so we've seen a lackluster performance of the markets um, in the last couple of sessions. Um, liquidity remains supportive. So that provides some level of support um, for the market. Also, uh, valuations, especially in financials, remain attractive. Mm -hmm. um, so we're seeing a level of support and pretty much uh, flatness. Well, just when we thought the Nigerian banking sector was exciting, we've got uh, South Africa's banking sector bringing in some excitement of its own. We've heard that HSBC has made uh, a bid for a 70% uh, stake uh, in a Nedbank here in South Africa. What are you making of this deal? Because we do know that Nedbank has ties uh, to the African continent via its alliance with Ecobank Group. Yes, um, I mean, it affords Nedbank, well, HSBC by extension, um, a footprint on the continent. Um, Ecobank Transnational, of course, has um, a huge stake in Ecobank Nigeria, about 85%. And, you know, we've had a lot of concerns as regards uh, rescued banks, for instance, and devaluation of toxic assets. So uh, a, much, uh, a, a much more hassle-free, you know, avenue to gain a footprint is mm -hmm. through, you know, buying a smaller institution or gaining access through a smaller institution uh, with much less worries where valuations are more attractive. Um, so we expect to see a few, much of, a few more of such deals, you know, going forward as it avails uh, bigger institutions access to a pretty um, lowly served retail market, which I think is the icing on the cake for most of them. Well, while that may be the, you know, the case and we're looking at a player like HSBC getting a handle on its footprint on the continent via this route, many have been skeptical in the first place of what that relationship between the Nedbank Group and Ecobank has actually meant. Or what kind of you know, uh, tangible uh, results have you seen from that tie-up and uh, you know, where either of these parties have stood as strong benefactors? Well, I mean, most of the operations of um, Ecobank Transnational, for instance, are in Nigeria. Um, and so far, you know, the strategy of the company in the past, you know, um, of the bank, I mean, highlighted some of the inherent risks. Um, Ecobank Nigeria was largely exposed to the stock market, for instance, and it had to take a huge hit with Ecobank Transnational having to recapitalize it uh, to a large extent. Um, the focus now, of course, will be to try and uh, gain some entry into the corporate segment, um, which most banks are into. But there's a huge, as I said, underserved uh, retail segment. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, uh, the bank will be looking to get cheaper deposits, for instance, and rule out uh, products that are targeted at the retail segment, where, of course, the margins tend to be higher. Oh, on that note, let's leave it there on the banking sector and shift focus to a sector that has really uh, seemed to got uh, been getting attention over the last couple of weeks. We were looking at the flower space uh, uh, in particular. I mean, they've been in the spotlight, many saying there's a value to be reaped here. How are you viewing the flower players uh, in Nigeria at the moment? Well, on a valuation basis, um, just, you know, using earnings multiples, they look quite attractive. Um, the, I mean, last year, the year 2009, was quite attractive for them because in that year, we saw wheat prices uh, come down, their margins improve. Um, recent developments have been, you know, the, uh, on the contrary, though. We've seen wheat prices uh, pretty much double in the last uh, about two months. Um, so the prospects going forward um, portend, you know, a bit of margin erosion um, for them. Um, there's still a bit of a monopoly in the industry. Uh, they're only about three or four strong players there with flour mills, Dangote flour, Honeywell, for instance, being major participants. Um, so it's going to be interesting how they play. They, they have um, a bit less room to manoeuvre in terms of passing on higher prices 
um, to their end users. So efficiency will be critical. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them have engaged in improvements to their production plants. Um, that should provide some benefits. But we're going to see some price uh, pressures going forward. Um, so in terms of the outlook for the industry, there are still a few good players. Flour mill still looks quite good. But we should see performance tempered as against the strong growth we had in the last year. Would you be a buyer in this space in any of those big players, Honeywell and Gorti, or uh, flour mills of Nigeria? Yeah. Well, flour mills looks um, quite interesting uh, to the extent that it's also quite diversified. Uh, flour mills is into uh, bag production. Uh, it's also into cement importation. Um, so it is relatively uh, insulated, although the bulk of its operation is still in the flower space. Uh, but it's quite an efficient institution. It's shown its interest in expanding its capacity through um, inorganic uh, acquisitions as well. Um, so we, we think it's quite attractive, especially as it's trading on just over seven times earnings at this point in time. It will certainly be interesting to see how these players hold up in the face of possible rising wheat prices moving forward, uh, which and where wheat is a big input cost for them, as you highlighted earlier. Taking a look at the broader uh, macroeconomic implications here, Deji, when it comes to inflation in the country, we saw last week inflation figures being adjusted for the month of June from 10.3% to 14%. Now, that's quite a spike higher. A market reaction to that revised data? Well, we haven't seen any um, very visible reactions to the data and um, to the extent that um, it was um, it was also largely the impact of a revision of uh, the base, you know, um, the base year was, you know, moved uh, forward a bit. So I think uh, market participants are looking at what will happen um, going forward in terms of the trend with inflation. We've seen, you know, the push up, uh, but, you know, inflation is determined largely by food prices, for instance. And I think market participants will be very interested in how that um, trends going forward with a lot yeah. of the um, exports to Niger, for instance, as well as the issues with money supply, you know, especially in the run up to elections. Well, we heard last week that uh, Governor Lamido Sanusi uh, said that, you know, he would be happy with a headline inflation rate of between nine and nine and a half percent and that uh, creating economic growth should be the priority with inflation ticking. Uh, this much outside of that target band, though, Deji, do you think that there's a need for a possible relook at, pos uh, at policy here? Should inflation targeting be back on the agenda? Well, I mean, to uh, a large extent, so, you know, I agree with him. Um, economic growth is proving much more of a problem, especially in sort of more visible areas. Um, we've seen credit growth uh, largely constrained, even with you know, the sort of stimulus um, uh, packages that the CBN has pushed forward. Uh, at this point, I think they will be reluctant um, to rein in um, the level of supply that they have mm -hmm. allowed uh, prevail uh, because we really haven't seen much of an impact. I think there'll be a lot of moral suasion on banks uh, to increase their lending. But yeah, yeah. It's, uh, I think they're caught between two, you know, pretty difficult points yep. um, right now.